Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the last parallel session of the conference on conformal field theories. We are very happy to start with Stefan Forste from University of Bonn talking about orbifold averages. Please. Hello everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here and thanks to the organizers uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this work. So the title of the talk is Orbifold Averages. <coughs> and this is based on work done together with Hans Jokas, Joshua Kamus King, Alexandros Kanargias, and Aida Zadeh. And uh, this talk will be about averaging over ensembles of two dimensional conformal field theory. So, what I will do in the introduction, I will introduce two ensembles from the literature where this has been done, which will be relevant for the rest of the talk. And then I will uh, describe what we are looking at how one can take the average over the ensemble that I will describe here. Then I won't have, unfortunately, very much have to say about uh, the bike theory. And so that will be more like an op open question. And then I will conclude. Oops. Right. OK. So as we have learned on Monday, uh, there's a new, new uh, aspect of ADS-CFT duality. So originally it was uh, a duality between two theories, like for example type 2B string theory on ADS space is dual to any quits for super young mid theory, so two very defined theories. But more recently there have been examples where actually the ADS uh, theory is dual to an ensemble of uh, CFT. So the, the most prominent example is perhaps the Jackie Teidelbaum gravity, just pure Jack of Teidelbaum gravity in two dimensions is due to a random matrix model, which you can view as an ensemble of uh, quantum mechanical Hamiltonians. And uh, here we will be interested in ensembles of two dimensional conformal field theories and more on the ensemble side. So I will, I will uh, look at these ensembles and uh, see how one can compute the average of the partition function. So the first, uh, the first example in the, for this two-dimensional field theories are just three bosons compactified on a d-dimensional torus, so that's like string theory on a torus. And this has been uh, done by Afkami Jedi, Cohen, Hartmann, Taidini, and independently also by Maloney and Witten. And uh, here you, you uh, write down first the partition function. So the eta is the dedicated eta function that contains all the vibration modes. And, uh, and this is a sum over the zero modes. And the sum over the zero modes is expressed in this context in terms of a sigma narine theta function. And here the subscript H encodes the moduli dependence. And this, uh, so that's the only moduli dependent part coming from the sum over the zero modes. And then one averages over moduli space, which is this space of even self dual lattices here. And uh, one ends up with uh, using the siegel weil formula for this, uh, for this function here. One ends up with the real analytic Eisenstein series written down here. So one has to mod out shifting tau by an integer because that wouldn't change and you would get infinity. OK. Good. So uh, uh, these people also proposed a dual for that, so which is not quite gravity. It is, uh, contains a little bit of gravity in this uh, topological gravity, but mainly it's just John Simon's theory, a Bayesian John Simon's theory. So these U ones are due to the chiral and anti-chiral currents in, on the S, uh, S, uh, on the uh, conformal field theory side, and then you take the John Simon's partition function, you compute it on a solid torus, and you sum over all solid tori which are under the constraint that the boundary two-dimensional torus should have complex structure tau, and tau was the uh, complex structure of the virtual torus. So um, then the next, exam uh, and the next example I want to discuss in this introduction is due to Benjamin Keller, Oguri, and Zadeh. And there, instead of just looking at the torus, you look at an orbifold of a torus. So the, when we describe the torus as, a, as modding out uh, d-dimensional real space by a lattice, then the orbifold is described by just 
uh, the uh, inversion at the origin of this uh, covering space. And then any lattice is invariant because the lattice vector is just mapped to minus the lattice vector and that generates the same lattice. So the moduli space is the same as before. But now when you compute the partition function, you have to insert a projector onto orbifold even states. So theta is a, the two generator and you project uh, onto the two even states. And in addition, you have to also include twisted sector uh, states, which are strings which close only up to a orbifold identification. But the contributions with the insertions of that and or from twisted sector, they actually do not depend on the moduli. So then it's easy to take the average. You just, from this first one half, you get the amplitude from before, the partition function from before. So you get what, uh, what I had on the previous transparency. And then averaging over something which doesn't depend on the moduli just gives the same answer. So you get this contributions from insertions and twisted sector, which I didn't write down explicitly here. And the three-dimensional dual is uh, now a chern simon theory again. But in addition to these uh, U1 fields, you also have a Z2 gauge symmetry. And this means, for example, that you have to include contributions where when you go, when you go once around this torus like this, the, the boundary condition is such that the gauge field gets a minus sign uh, after going around once. And that would be a vortex solution. So you have to include that and you also have to, to uh, project on that to even gauge configurations. And then you actually can match this partition function. So now let me come to what uh, we have done. Uh, so we also look at something quite similar, namely a, a modified orbifold. And here I will start with a low dimensional example which doesn't quite work because everything diverges in the end, but it's good to uh, somehow see the details of, uh, of how the orbifold acts. So in this two-dimensional example, I take the orbifold action just on one of the directions, and that now reduces the moduli space. So the taking the average will be modified from the previous examples. So, uh, so for example, the B field, which previously was arbitrary, now since one index is only reflected, it gets a minus sign. And then uh, the B field is defined up to an integer. So there are the possible values of 0 and 1 half correspond to invariant backgrounds. And uh, that means, uh, in more fancy words, that the real part of the scalar structure can be 0 or 1 half of this two torus. Uh, and uh, but also the uh, complex structure will be will be uh, restricted. So let's have a look at that. So let's look at possible lattices. So they have to be invariant under the action. So this, what we will call the factorizability two, is invariant because this vector is just mapped to minus the same vector, which generates again the same lattice. So this factorizable is just circle times circle. And uh, one, one circle becomes an orbicircle. And in this case, the complex structure which is obtained by dividing that complex vector by this complex vector, or by complex number by that complex number, doesn't have a real part, and that would be the Kähler structure. OK. But there's another possibility, namely that, that uh, now if we take the first lattice vector again as uh, along the real axis, and then the second one, if the real part of the second one is half the real part of the first one, that will be also invariant lattice because when you reflect this, you get a vector like that. And that differs only by a shift by this vector from the original one. So you generate the same lattice. And now we can compute the complex structure and it is real part one half. So like for the Kähler structure where the real part was constrained to be 0 or 1 half, also the same happens for the complex structure. OK. Good. Um, so now uh, let's uh, compute the partition functions in these two examples. And I will consider, I will restrict even to more, uh, to, to, to less examples. I will just look at the factorizable with a zero B field or at the non factorizability to 
also with zero B field. And this one is T dual actually to the factorizable with B field one half. So the factorizable is very easy. So it's just the product of a circle compactification and an orbi circle compactification. So when you compute the partition function, that is just the product of uh, of these uh, circle partition function and orbi circle partition function. So circle partition function is here. Here's the moduli dependence and the sum over winding and momenta. And orbi circle is here again half times the circle because of this insertion insertion of one half plus one half theta. And this is a term now written explicitly which doesn't depend on the radius of the orbi circle. So that's twisted sector and or insertion. Okay. Now the non-factorizable is a bit more complicated but it can be done. You sum again over winding and momenta but then you have to do something in order to be able to perform the average, at least at a, a schematic level. You have to get this into a form where, where each term factorizes into something which depends only on, uh, on the circle, on, on, the, on the radius of the orbi circle, and on, the, on the one radius and on the other modulus. Um, right, so therefore here you have to split binding and momentum sum into even and odd uh, combinations and that gives you, this is just the, just the T2 amplitude rewritten now in terms of uh, products of R1 dependent terms times R2 dependent terms. And, there, and, and the price you have to pay for that to rewrite it like that is that you get here now different moduli, but these combinations are still modular invariant. And here you even have a different dependence on the target space modulus. Okay, good. So now let's take ensemble averages, but this I can do here only at the formal level because uh, everything diverges. So in the end, I, I will get some regulated ensemble averages, so that's more like to get the pattern. So we will just consider these R1s and R2s in both cases as our moduli, and we will integrate over them. And uh, as an integration measure, you take the Samologikov measure which uh, just also factorizes again. So it's uh, invariant and this is uh, replacing R by its inverse and it factorizes into an uh, integral over R1 and R2. And for simplicity, I will just integrate over the naive range, but that doesn't matter. So the actual moduli space, so this will be a, a, a quartic or double cover of the actual moduli space. But then if I divide just by the, by the multiplicity, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, so then I get for the factorizable case just uh, one half uh, the the uh, the circle squared from from the term where, in, where for the orbi circle there was no insertion, no twisted sector, and here that is the uh, that doesn't depend on or that didn't depend on the mo on the mo on the radius of the orbi circle. I don't, uh, I don't see the pointer anymore, but it should be there. Yeah, it's a very weak. Right, uh, okay, so maybe I show it like this. So this uh, is a part which doesn't depend on the obvious circle, and that comes from the circuit. And for the uh, non-factorizable now, you just replace when you when you integrate over this covering space of your modular space, you can just replace every term by its average, so you get the sum of products of averages. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this, uh, so one can take the average at the formal level, but things uh, are divergent. So uh, we have to go to higher dimensions to get some expressions which uh, make sense. So let's, uh, here I will just look at two examples. So for higher dimensions, you can take factorizable and non factorizable also together. So I will just look at uh, Two examples, there are much more possible examples. So first I will look at the factorizable case, completely factorizable. So I take a two d-dimensional, even dimensional torus, which can be written as a product of two d-dimensional tori. 
and uh, these are, uh, are obtained by modding out. Did I mention a Euclidean space with, uh, with, the, uh, with the lattice? And now it's convenient to take the, the generating vectors for the lattice also as a coordinate basis, and then every, the moduli are just in metric and B field. So the scalar products of your lattice vectors give the, the metric, for example. And then, uh, I know it works again. And then the orbifold acts just on half of the direction, say, on, on this T, TD. So that will, will, be a, will be an orbifold, and this will be still the torus. And then I look at moduli, which are invariant under this action. And uh, here I pick, uh, I pick this choice. So there are, again, discrete choices, in particular for the B-field, so I will come to the non-factorizable. For the B-field, you could have discrete choices here, which I switch off. So I just look at this choice. And these are set to zero because under this reflection, those components would get a minus sign. And again, for the B-field, I put these to zero. So there will be other discrete possibilities there. And, uh, then the moduli space factorizes, so that's easy to see because of this block diagonal structure. And you just get for the average the product of the lower dimensional averages, which we have discussed in the introduction. So that's quite, uh, quite trivial. But now let's look at this non-factorizable case. Uh, no, before, sorry. Let's still look at the factorizable case. So we use the two examples from, from the beginning. So just this. Uh, bosons on the torus and uh, bosons on an orbifold and multiply them with each other and we get this result. Okay. So now let's look at the uh, non-factorizable torus. And uh, here I can, let's first go back and look at the T2 again, which was previously generated by these two by these two uh, vectors, which uh, made it easy in our case to introduce the moduli. But I can equivalently just replace this vector by the one which I obtain when I take this one minus this one. And then the Z2 acts as a permutation of the two basis vectors. So that picture is uh, now easy to generalize for the two-dimensional torus. I just go to the previous coordinate space and uh, swap the first set of D coordinates with the second set. Okay, and then I'm looking at moduli, which are invariant. And, and uh, when I, sw so I swap the first D entries with the second D entries, so this block should be the same as that block. This block should be the same as that block. Here, here similar. But now these are written in a funny way. But the reason that, uh, that these are rewritten like this, with little g and little g tilde, and little b and little b tilde, is that now the Samalogikov metric factorizes. And uh, yeah, and this H is this ODD uh, covariant combination. So it factorizes into moduli with a tilde, with a tilde, and without a tilde. So that will be useful. And now, now one has again to rewrite the partition function. So when we, uh, you could, so all, all this, the sum which I've written here is actually the torus partition function, which I had on the first transparency. But that would depend, uh, so that, that, maybe I go back to the first transparency, or second, no, third transparency. <coughs> so if I, if I wrote down this, I cannot use Siegener Rein, uh, I cannot use the siegel weil formula because for that I would have to integrate over the full moduli space of the torus, but that has been reduced now. So, uh, so one has to do some tricks to rewrite this in a form that one can actually uh, perform the integral over the reduced moduli space. And we have just seen that the, the measure factorizes into terms with a tilde and without a tilde. And here you can do the same for the, uh, for the uh, partition function. And these theta h's, they are kind of generalized uh, siegel theta functions. So they were, of course, introduced by Siegel, but also appeared, also appeared in a paper 
of Dong, Hartmann, and Jiang, who actually looked at uh, marginal deformations of vesomino witten models and took averages there. So they also had to look at these uh, generalized uh, theta functions. And they actually also derived uh, averages for those. And, uh, and this is quite convenient. And in our case, one can actually also rewrite the averages. So it's not, one doesn't get immediately this. One still has to do some work to rewrite the averages in terms of Siegel and Rhein theta functions. So this all comes from the torus amplitude with no insertion, no twisted sector. And this can now be written as a, so this could be viewed as an average of a lower dimensional torus with a different uh, complex structure. And this is uh, twisted sector and insertion contributions. OK. So the bulk dual, I'm afraid I don't have to say much for the bulk dual. So for the factorizable case, I can say something, but that's, uh, that's quite trivial. So for there, we have seen that, that, uh, that the average factorizes into a product of, uh, of the first example I was discussing in the introduction times the second example. And, uh, and we know that each, just from the literature, we know that each factor can be obtained uh, as a partition function of a 3D uh, theory. So then the recipe would be straightforward. You just take two solid tori. On one of them, you put the dual for this, so just u1 to the 2D. On the second one, on the second solid torus, you put, uh, you put the theory dual to that. And then you sum over pairs of solid tori with a restriction that uh, both boundary T2s have to have the same complex structure, which should be identified with the complex structure of the virtue torus. But for the non-factorizable, I don't know. I mean, there should be several sectors now contributing, and it's not clear how to get there. OK, so now let me conclude. So what I have done is to consider uh, modified orbifold actions on a 2D-dimensional torus, where I reflected only half of the direction, but you could also reflect uh, one third, uh, if you want. But uh, here I looked at half of the directions. And, uh, and then I've, uh, I've seen that there are several discrete choices for the two prime invariant backgrounds. And I took each of these choices as an, an ensemble of conformal field theories. And I was, obtain, uh, was able to obtain an average over these ensembles. And for the factorizable ensemble, that also made sense because I could get the bike dual. So then it's a useful identification of an ensemble. So for the non-factorizable case, we could take the average. But uh, we don't know how to, how to construct a bike bike dual, so we don't know whether it exists. So whether it is a useful ensemble in this context, uh, that we cannot say at the moment. Uh, and then one idea one could do further. So that was actually our original idea. Look at the two times the two orbifolds. So for example, Calabo Yao, you can write as a, you can get as a, or the orbifold limit of a Calabo Yao would be a T6 over that two times the two, where the action on, on, uh, uh, is quite similar, that, uh, that uh, the Z2 acts only on some directions. And in this case, well, there would be, would be also the choice of discrete torsion. And then you could ask the question whether one should include the discrete torsion into the same ensemble. And there we got initially some indications that indeed one should do that. But, uh, but uh, at the moment, we cannot really say much because we didn't work this out. OK, then uh, thank you very much for listening. So yeah, is there any progress in finding the bulk dual for the non factorizable case? Not at the moment, I'm afraid. Not at the moment. OK. Uh, and one more question that I had is that, uh, can we use these t techniques that you are using here to find the orbifold of some more exotic target spaces? For example, if you want to uh, you know, calculate uh, you know, similar partition functions for the target space of uh, where you take a Z3 orbifold of some club, can you do it? 
you would need a conformal field description of your color BO. I mean, so, so you, I mean, the idea was to, to uh, I mean, that you could look at an orbifold limit of a color BO where you have a mm -hmm. conformal field description, conformal field theory description. And uh, in this paper, in this paper, here actually these authors looked at uh, at uh, K3 okay. theories, but there they found that uh, that it didn't work really. Okay, okay, I see. Thank you. There's. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I was curious about the dependence on the choice of signature of the lattice. Um, so, yeah, d d does is this something which can change um, the structure of the um, average? Uh, perhaps it would change the structure of the average, but I didn't really look. I mean, usually you, you compactify on Euclidean space so I guess it would change things yes but okay the lattice no you meant the event of the lattice no, but that always has a DD signature right or if you look there look or you may if I look at heterotic yeah I, I, I was I had heterotic in mind okay that I don't know yeah no then then it should be probably similar only that you have more moduli from the right. bits and lines so it might be interesting yeah. okay yeah. actually there is a, the Japanese group is quite active on that front. There are a series of papers, um, Kidambi and lo uh, friends, collaborators, they have worked out um, uh, averages for lattices. All of them are indefinite, you talk about mm -hmm. photons, yeah, right. but different uh, dimensions, yeah. That, so heterotic will be actually a sub, an example of the more general case that they have considered. I see, uh, the I see. Uh -huh. Japanese collaboration. They have made a lot of progress. I see. Interesting. And that 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 uh, could be combined with these uh, with the orbifold kind of structures that you're introducing here. Technically, and yes. Yeah. I, I don't think this has been worked out. Okay. Uh, no, I think uh, yeah. I don't know. Or maybe. No, no. Sorry. They worked it out for some special cases. I think only the two, because the two, everyone loves the two. No, <laughs> I think for some ca special case, but more general, no. And I think also the Z2 was just a vanilla, not geometric uh, mm -hmm. motor, just uh, mm -hmm. inversion, uh, uh, involution, simple. Yeah, but um, yeah, one can refer. They have a very, they have massive papers. It may be that there is actually a lot more there. Okay, I see. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Stefan? Um, if not, let's thank him again for the thank nice you. work.